Welcome back to Snowflake Summit 2023. You're watching theCUBE's coverage. This is day one, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. The man of the hour, Kristen Kleinerman is here, Senior Vice President of Product at Snowflake. He had most of the keynote today. Kristen, good to see you again. Thanks for making some time Thank for Thank you us. for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, I mean, you still got a lot of energy. So it's only day one, but you've been prepping and you've been talking to customers. All data, all workloads, that's the high level message. And you know, George and I have been talking leading up to this, you have the unified data platform and we want to dig into that with you a little bit. You got a lot of ways to query, you keep expanding those, you got a lot of different data types that you support and it's all integrated, is our understanding. Super important, right? any ways to query, one engine. Okay, so all this integrated. Is, so this is something that's a really important point that we wanted to talk to you about because I think sometimes that gets lost in all the, the product fire hose, so explain that. Yeah, for, for us it was very important that the choice of programming language to query, or programming model, if you want to use a different API, it should be a choice of form, not a choice of capability or performance. The last thing you want to do is, oh, if you use Python, you get certain characteristics in terms of performance, but if you use SQL, you use something else, and Java is different. For us, it was a choice is choice, not trade-offs, so single engine, multiple ways to query the data. But okay, but it's, I got to follow up on that. So it's not like a caravan where this, the whole caravan has to slow down for the slowest truck, right? It's, it's the opposite. You get the slowest truck and you figure out how to make it keep up with the caravan, is that fair? So, so we started with some of the most demanding use cases. Like if you look at SQL powering BI dashboards for large scale data, that is a demanding workload. So we've been tuning this engine for 12, 14 years on those use cases. And I have no problem saying that by the time we started seeing some of the PySpark scenarios coming to Snowpark for Python, and it's like, why is this so much faster and so much better? It's because it was not, everything is slowed down. No, everything is sped up. And the same thing with Iceberg, you guys announced the sort of parity there. Our, our, our sense is, and just in discussions, is and just observing is, you want to be the best place to develop applications, fastest, most cost efficient, right? most perf performant, et cetera. Correct. And very, very important is to articulate the motivation for that. If you believe the first four or five years of the company, and it still happens to this day, but the focus originally was, let's help our customers break down silos. The dream of having a single data fabric where you can ask questions about your customer holistically, your product line holistically. And what we saw was, okay, on one side you're unsiloing, and on the other side you're resiloing. And one of the biggest reasons for resiloing is applications, because every application realized with more data you do better. So our goal is keep customers unsiloed, bring applications, bring business logic to the data. Yeah, because George, I think a lot of people last year said, oh, Iceberg, that's just a, a competitive knockoff, as opposed to you want to be the best at. So. We, we want to be awesome at everything we do, and Iceberg is our way to meet customers where they are. If someone already invested in having tens or hundreds of petabytes of data in parquet files in cloud storage, I, I don't know that we need to force anyone any, any, down any one path, just iceberg isn't a choice. And one of the big announcements today is this two modes of iceberg unified tables. So if you just want to start querying data that you have in cloud storage, unmanaged tables are good for you. It's a read-only activity. But if you want to say Snowflake should take over the administration, management, consistency of that data, you can upgrade it to a managed table. So what we're giving customers is choice and stepping stones to decide where they are comfortable. So let's take that one step further. So some other vendors have managed to uh, standardize on a, on a table format and maybe even across vendors. But now, let's say taking, taking this beyond that, where with the partnership with Blue Yonder, you know, once upon a time an application vendor had to have many different data formats and, and engines for you know, diagnostic, for predictive, for transactional, how can they standardize? Tell us how they're standardizing so that 
not only do they have you know, one stack, but that stack can be shared, that data can be shared with other applications. Yeah. Well, what gets me excited about what we're doing is we're providing programming models that are familiar to folks. Yeah. You know, we use SQL, which is strictly a standard. Okay, that's one path. But data frame based programming, I wouldn't call it a standard, but a de facto standard, and you can use that. So as long as you standardize or use quasi-standard access paths or access patterns, then how the data is represented matters a little bit less. But the benefit of supporting open file formats like Parquet, open table formats like Iceberg, is even if you want to have a different way to access the data, you can do so in an open way. So take, take that example of, of supply chain. So a company like Blue Yonder, which is, you know, has a bunch of legacy manugistics uh, 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 workloads, could they take the container services, bring the manugistic workloads in there, and then have it be a sort of first party citizen in terms of their ability to use that data? From a, from a realm of, is it possible? Absolutely. They, once you have some business logic running in a container, you can export it into, say, a function. That function was callable from SQL or from Python. That's the, the, we, we put a lot of emphasis on the cleanliness of the architecture so that things are composable, and that's what you see there. It, it so happens that maybe Blue Yonder is not the greatest example because they are on a journey to re-platformize directly on Snowflake. Well, they're basically re-architecting with using Snowflake right. and relational AI, which is a heavy lift, but I love it. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's either that or go private equity, so good, good for All you, right. Duncan. And, and many of the use cases on container services, especially for applications, is I am not ready to re-architect, but I want to bring that to run closer to the data, so that's one use case, but Blue Yonder, definitely uh, very exciting what they're doing. Well, it's a very challenging problem. Frank has talked about this a lot. Um, in fact, I think he even said one time, didn't he join a board of a supply chain company to really try to understand this better? This is a really, really hard problem. Yeah. So l let's talk about um, bringing data in, like the ingest pipeline and, and data engineering. It, for the longest time, was a big data processing or, or a DBT, you know, and you're bringing raw data in, well, or you landing the raw data and modeling it, you know, to, from bronze to silver to gold. So now that you have more and more data types and like Applica for LLM, do you see all data pipelines becoming um, sort of multimodal or multi-model, I should say? where you know, you're, you're shredding the documents, you're refining them, you're enriching them with the analytic data, and so now your single source of truth is broad. Yeah, so again, the, the purity of our design makes things composable, and from, by, by virtue of that, usable in a variety of contexts. We show the user interface based off document AI. Yeah. But there's also a function that you can call. That function can be included in a dynamic table or in a pipeline that you build yourself, you orchestrated yourself. It could be something even orchestrated by Airflow or by DBT. So in, in, in no situation we're saying, oh, we, we got it all. No, that there's enough complexity in the world, but the key thing is if you have building blocks that can plug in and work well together, then you can do a lot of things. And the document AI is an example. You can also go and take language models, wrap them in a snow park function, even if you want to go out, out to, to the internet, and those functions, all of them, combine them in a single query. When it comes to Gen AI, would you say your number one differentiator is your governance model? Yes. Um, I would say the broad approach that we've been pursuing around bringing computation to the data is all about let's do rich programmability of data without compromising governance, because we provide lots of capabilities to deliver governance. Gen AI, in our mind, is just one extra way to transform data into value. And frankly, what's out there is, is, is exciting, it's cool, but governance is not front and center. It was more capability and show of ability. But enterprises, they need to have both. Amazing capability, but make sure that my policies, my role-based access is, is in check, and that's where many of the announcements of, of this week are exciting. 
So if we look at where application platforms are going, and I, I don't want to call you like just a, a data platform, data cloud, but a foundation for building future applications. Your power comes from all the data you're accumulating and curating in Snowflake because you use that not just to build apps but to train the models that are part of the apps. That's, that's your strength. There's two strengths. One is exactly what you said. You want the data to power these experiences. So that's great. But the other notion is once the logic is running close to the data, certifying or validating that that application is ready to run in my enterprise is a simpler process. Think of legal reviews and security reviews yeah. because I'm not copying data. And that simplification of the process is appealing to both the app developer and the customer. So the validation or testing now involves the data and the algorithm. Correct. Okay. Correct. Imagine if I tell you, here's a um, big supply chain, because we were there. Here's a solution that does supply chain. Okay. If I tell you, it, this app does everything you want, but you need to give me your data, how long does it take you to certify this app? But if we flip it, which is what we're doing, I say, here's the app, it's close to your data. Got it. We can vouch for this app is not copying your data out. We can vouch for this app is honoring your permissions. Will you be able to adopt that app faster? Our thesis, and at this point is widely validated, is yes, and that is attractive to you as the customer of the app, but also to the developer of the app. Can you explain the logic for the audience behind Neva? Yeah. We're very excited about Neva. I'll start saying that, both the technology and the team. Language models and Gen AI in, in general, they demo extremely well. We all look at those things and it, it is magical. It's the, the, the closest we've gotten to magical experiences. But there's one part of Gen AI, which is they, those models get limited context and then they start answering questions with high confidence based on their knowledge. And the implication of that is sometimes they make up stuff with very high confidence. Sounds like politicians. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to comment there, I'm not going to go there, but, but yes. Um, and what Neva did, and I think they were ahead of everyone, was you don't turn search into an LLM problem. You just say, here's a question, give me the answer. What they learned how to do, or they innovated, is how do you take traditional search technologies, traditional information retrieval technology, and augment it in the right places with language models. What they would do in their consumer search product is they could give you the results of a query that was conversational, but they could give you a citation. This statement we made is because of this link in the web. That, in our mind, is probably the single most important thing around Gen AI, which is you want to be able to trust it. You don't want to be able to ask questions and immediately have to go and fact check it and verify it. Imagine in the world of enterprise data, how it would work if you ask a question and you don't know if you can trust it. At least it will, with, with public chat GPT things, you can at least go and ask Google search to fact check you. But on, on your enterprise, it's harder. That is what they bring to the table, the ability to tr combine traditional information retrieval with LLM. What, what's the secret sauce behind their ability to do that, or now your ability to do that? It's the fact that you're not just giving the entire problem to a language model, it's the fact that it's primarily a traditional search indexing ranking technology, but it knows how to better understand language, how to better produce language, how to better produce summarization. So it's the combination of old and new technologies in what we think is better results. And so let me just drill down on the capability a little bit. So I imagine in the ingest pipeline that might have used document AI to structure, better structure your, com your documents and complex structured stuff, you might create um, embeddings, store that in a vector database, and then Neva could do the semantic search, the find me similar stuff, retrieve it, imprompt it in the, you know, invisibly, and then summarize it. Yes, a, a lot of the expertise they did was knowing where to use embeddings, where to augment context, where to provide additional context. So it's that, that combination of, of uh, traditional 
and new technologies that gets you to a new world, and that's why we're very excited, because we're bringing that to the enterprise. So, zoom out and zoom in on announcements. So the big three, Frank set them up this morning. Iceberg, Open Tables, native app framework, what we call the App Store for the enterprise, and then Snowpark Container Services. And then you got into it, I mean, you had new open source Snowflake command line interface, you had new logging and tracing APIs, you had auto sync with Git repositories, I mean, it's like whew. So, help us understand the strategy and the announcements and how it all fits together. Yeah. So, obviously the, the core of the announcements are bring more computation to Snowflake. That's where Snowpark Container Services dramatically expands on what we've done. We want to be able to provide distribution and monetization to this application, so this business logic. That's where native apps fits in. And one of the examples that we're showing was a native app backed by a Snowpark container service. So all of these efforts are synergistic. But some of the items that you, that you mentioned, Dave, come from the fact that, okay, you cannot have a, a, an app development framework if you don't have a platform that developers like. Because developers, as we all know, they're opinionated. And everything you just mentioned, the Git integration, which is super cool, logging, tracing, command lines, uh, Python APIs, all of that is to say, you cannot have platform without tools. And the message hopefully came out loud and clear. We're investing in the platform, but also in the tools to build on that platform. Yeah, making it easier for the developers is, I mean, <laughs> if, that's, if you're going to be the app store for the enterprise, it's got to be the place that they all, all want to go. Correct. The REST API is another one. The thing, think of the app stores and the phones. It's not just the ability to run those, it's how do you build them? And it comes with that entire developer experience, that's what we're delivering in addition to the platform. When you look out at your opportunities, I mean, there's no shortage of TAM, as we like to say. Where do you see the limits of your architecture? That is a great question. Uh, I talk a lot about this with Benoit, that some of these extensibility bets, Snowpark and Snowpark Container Services in general, are going to test us and are going to push us into scenarios that we cannot envision. In the same way that, I don't know that Steve Jobs ever thought of being having an app that controls the toothbrush. Like, it's these use cases that are mind boggling. So it's going to push us. At this point, we don't know exactly what those limits are, but the goal of the end of the keynote was to show, as we have today the technology, it already enables a very vast set of capabilities. So there will be limits. I don't know what they are, but we're excited about what's possible right now. And you're in control of some of those limits. As you said, it's really the ecosystem that is actually going to extend your, your reach pretty dramatically. The ecosystem here has grown quite a bit. Yeah. since and, last year. Yeah, and I'll mention, some early partners already are pushing us beyond what we had in the prior preview. Smaller things that were in the plan, but by the time this is all generally available, we're very confident and very excited about what's possible. At which point some of these uh, items need additional support from us, I don't know. So, customer feedback today. I mean, you've talked to a lot of customers, you get stopped in the hallways, I'm sure. Uh, you, you're actually just probably walking over from the other venue. What's been the feedback? What, what do they like? What are they pushing you on? What do they want to see more of? I, th I think Snowpark Container Services uh, overwhelmed the sentiment. I was just talking to someone, literally, as you said, on the way here, say, oh, I had a long list of things I wanted to try and my list just got way longer. <laughs> but the one thing that I think captured everyone's imagination is the container services. I heard expressions like mind blown, overwhelmed, can't stop thinking. So, uh, and that was a little bit of what we uh, aspire to convey, not because we want to do it, it's because that's how we feel about it. Yeah, well you keep evolving, it's, it, 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 I think you know, it's been described, oh we started out, here is the data warehouse, and then we got the data cloud, now we're more than the data cloud, and uh, can't wait to see what, what you come up with in the next couple of years, Christian. Uh, same, same here, I'll say, our partners, in, in the handful of weeks that we gave them access to container services, surprised us already. So it's going to be incredibly exciting from here on. It's great, well th thanks for coming on, to, and, and you're going to come on next. We're really excited to bring on uh, NVIDIA, Manu Radas is, is coming on, and we're going to dig into that big announcement that Snowflake and NVIDIA made 
last night. Dave Vellante for George Gilbert, Lisa Martin's in the house. Christian Kleinemann will be right back right after this short break.